Hi everyone, welcome to another episode in this segment. This week we're diving into net benefit curves, which have applications for AI and machine learning, especially with a medical context. I've got Elliot here with me. What's up? And today we're going to be talking about what is a net benefit curve? What does it look like? Then we're going to dive into the technicalities of it. Then we'll jump into the pros and cons and finish off with the applications for it outside of just the medical space. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of what a net benefit curve is? For sure. So a net benefit curve is a form of decision analysis similar to the receiver operating characteristic, the precision recall curve, and it's all about answering the question of, I have this machine learning model that I've trained. Does it provide me with some sort of overall utility? Uh, and it was originally created by uh, a team led by Andrew Vickers, who's at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, uh, and has typically been applied to medical applications. So should we perform this medical intervention on a patient? Uh, but you can really think of it being applied uh, in any case where there's varying costs between a false positive and uh, a true positive, and you need to somehow weigh those up. Now, what does a net benefit curve look like and what's on its axes? How does it work? Sure. So a net benefit curve has two axes, one of them being the net benefit, not surprisingly, and the other one being this idea of threshold probability. So the first thing we really need to understand to get into the world of net benefit curves is what on earth is a threshold probability? And I'll use the medical context uh, because it's the most commonly cited, but you can apply this pretty much anywhere. Uh, in the medical context, we think about true positives and false positives. And let's say it's whether or not to do a biopsy on a patient that we suspect might have, say, cancer. Let's say maybe we're looking at a picture of a mole on somebody's skin and we're saying, okay, maybe we do a biopsy. Now, a biopsy is not uh, that crazy. It's not... Uh, too expensive, it's not too invasive, but it is you know, more invasive than say taking a picture or, or taking a blood draw. Uh, it is an invasive procedure. And we have to think, or clinicians have to think, how many false positives, so biopsies that end up being benign and non-cancerous, would I be willing to do for every case that I correctly get? Uh, so for every cancer that I pick up, and you know, for something that's very aggressive, uh, let's say you know, an aggressive form of skin cancer, you might say, well, look, given that I can do a skin biopsy in my office, uh, it's small, it's quick, it's cheap, we don't need you know, large amounts of anesthetic, very low risk, I'd be happy to cut out 10 benign moles if it means that I pick up one case of uh, high-grade cancer. And in that case, the threshold probability would be a ratio of one to 10. So we're willing to do 10 negative procedures for every one positive procedure. Different doctors may have different thresholds. The community as a whole might develop uh, some consensus guidelines about how many positives uh, we need for every say 100 biopsies done. And that helps us make a clinical decision. So the first thing we need to look at is how do we actually calculate net benefit? Uh, we can understand benefit you know, why there might be a benefit to say doing a biopsy, diagnosing a cancer and then ultimately treating it. Uh, but this term net is, as it is in many cases, a difference between some other threshold benefit. In the case of a net benefit curve, the zero point, so when there's no net benefit, would be treating nobody. It would be saying, under no circumstances am I gonna follow through with this follow-up procedure. And what we want to be able to answer is using our tool, uh, whether that's a risk calculator or some AI model, as our determiner of the risk of the patient for say having this cancer, how much better off are we going to be compared to two different scenarios? That one I already described, which is don't treat anybody. And the alternative extreme scenario, which is treat everybody. So biopsy everybody that walks through the door. And we perform a calculation to get the net benefit. And that calculation looks like this. So uh, to calculate the net benefit, 
we take the number of true positives and then we subtract the false positives times some factor. And we'll call that factor F for the time being. Uh, and then because we want rates, we divide it by the total number. Now this F here is really dependent on that threshold probability that we talked about before. How many positives are we willing to, uh, how many negatives are we willing to take before we get one positive result? And that's calculated here as PT over one minus PT, where PT might be 10% uh, if we're happy for you know, roughly one in 10 of those to be positive. And so what we would do to calculate the net benefit in that scenario, let's say we have a machine learning model that has a fixed sensitivity and specificity. We'd calculate the true positives and the false positives of a cohort of people uh, and divide that by the total cohort size. And we'd set our, our F factor, our decision threshold. Let's say we're happy to do a biopsy in anyone that has more than 5% uh, probability of having cancer. We want to be pretty conservative because it's, let's say it's an aggressive cancer in this case. Let's say we have a cohort of 100 people that we're going to run this test on. Within that, let's say we have five people that do have that disease. Uh, and when we run our test, we have our magical AI model that we've generated uh, at some other point. We run all 100 people through that AI, and what we get out the other side is a percentage chance for each one of these people. Now, getting that percentage chance means that we've calibrated our AI model, we've taken the score that it produces and, and taken that back to a percentage, and for each of these 100 people, we're gonna get some score. Now, we said before that our threshold for doing a biopsy on these patients is if their score happened to be above 5%. Now let's say in our theoretical example, four out of the five people that did have the disease got a score of above 5%. And additionally, let's say 11 people who didn't have the disease also got a score of above 5%. To then calculate the net benefit fit with our 5% threshold, we'd say, what are our true positives? which is four, and we would subtract our false positives, which is 11, times by our 5% threshold over a one minus 5% threshold. So in this case, if we put all those numbers in, we divide it by the total population size of 100, our net benefit comes out to be 0.03. So in this case, there is a slight benefit over not treating any of these patients. And you can imagine that we could calculate this number for a varying different thresholds, all the way from 0% up to 100% as varying cutoffs that mean we're either more lenient or more strict with who we decide, uh, decide to test. And by calculating those values at all of those different threshold probabilities, we can then generate a curve which then becomes the net benefit curve. So what do we do with that? We plot it on a axis. And so on the Y axis here, we get our calculated net benefit scores. And on the X axis here, we have our different decision probabilities. Now those two lines that I talked about before, there's the treat nobody line, which happens at zero along this axis here, which is the treat no one. And you can imagine this to say that you know, if we don't do any treatment compared to the base case, which is doing nothing, there can't be any positive or negative there. The other line that comes through this is the treat everybody line. And the way that works is we do that same calculation on true positives, false positives at varying different thresholds, knowing that five people in our made up cohort of 100 actually have the disease. Uh, and we draw this line here. And what we'll find is that this line crosses with a net benefit of 0.05, which is the uh, underlying prevalence. Uh, out, and where it crosses this nobody line is also at the 5% mark. Uh, because if we set our thresholds too high, uh, we'll be worse than treating nobody. 
and if we set them too low, we may see some benefit. When we've got our AI model, we then will plot its net benefit at various different points along the line. Now that might start up here, it might come through, and then it might exceed going forward and go all the way across to 100%. And where these lines end up on the chart helps us determine whether this model is useful for making clinical decisions. So how do you interpret this graph now you've got these lines on it? So there's a couple of different scenarios where we might use a net benefit curve. Uh, there's one where we are comparing a single test, say this test here in red, to the treat nobody and the treat everybody scenarios. In that case, we need to make a clinical decision, uh, which is ultimately often outside the hands of the AI practitioner, to say, okay, in the areas where the AI model's curve sits above the net benefit of treating everybody and the net benefit of treating nobody, does this fall within the range of sort of acceptable behaviors? Uh, so we know that say at 5%, we would be getting a lot of false positives at that point. Uh, but you know we may say that it's worthwhile because the cancer we may be looking for is quite aggressive. The other scenario that we may look at is comparing two different models. So let's say we have two different diagnostic tests that uh, assess different factors. Maybe they're different blood tests. Maybe one's an AI model, one's a traditional blood test. Within the region of uh, decision thresholds that we clinically care about, uh, or that we, I should say practically care about, because there are applications here outside of uh, clinical utility, we have a look at which curve is higher. Now, if we say that our range that we care about is here, the green line is above the red line in all cases. So we would say, given that this is our sort of utility range, using that green test is better than using that red test. If our range is earlier on in this graph, let's say between here and here, where these two lines cross, we say, okay, it's inconclusive. There are some scenarios where the red test is better, some when the green test is better. Uh, and we have to decide what to do in that particular scenario. Uh, and in other cases, it may be worse on all fronts. But what this allows us to do is to say, okay, within the range of reasonable clinical decision making, does this test provide some benefit over the other test or over the two most extreme scenarios, which is intervene on everybody or intervene on nobody? So we've got our curves now, points of where we can make comparisons on. Where has this shown good clinical applicability and what are its shortcomings? So the original context in which this was created, uh, which is an area that Andrew Vickers works in a lot, is uh, in the world of prostate cancer testing. So historically, you know, PSA testing within prostate cancer, it's been a little bit give and take as to whether the benefits outweigh the harms. Uh, and this technique can help to determine, you know, where there may be a benefit from, say, PSA testing or maybe some of the newer tests like Prostate Health Index, the 4K score, or an AI solution uh, compared to traditional setups uh, in a way that, you know, ROC curves and precision recall curves and, you know, simpler metrics like accuracy don't give enough of a picture to really demonstrate. But on the flip side, this is where one of the difficulties of these curves appears, is that somebody still needs to make a decision as to the tolerable benefit to harm ratio, which is a very hard thing to do. You can imagine in some cases, let's say taking a sample of cerebrospinal fluid, which is a very invasive procedure, uh, very painful, uh, and you know, as with any procedure, not without its risks, you want to make sure that as much as possible you're getting positive results there. So you don't want to do that test lightly. Uh, on the other hand, if the test is something simple like, or the next step I should say is something simple like getting a follow-up blood test, we can have a much more conservative range of uh, additional probabilities or, or utility probabilities because we're weighing that the next step is really not that much of a problem. Um, but from the point of view of somebody developing AI, whether it be in the medical space around, you know, should we 
intervene with a test or say perhaps in the financial space where the decision might be, should we mark this transaction as fraud or should we audit this person's transactions? Uh, somebody really with domain knowledge needs to step in and make that decision because the AI practitioner themselves is unlikely to be an expert in that space. So this net benefit curve seems to me like when you combine the two concepts of risk and intervention, how would you consider when is the best point to intervene or not? Where do you see this having applications outside of the medical space? And do you actually think that this would have legs in the broader AI community? I think there are certainly some scenarios where this could provide a benefit. I would say really when the cost of the next step is high, either in the positive or the negative, decision curves and decision curve analysis can be a useful tool. So for example, in the financial space, if we are classifying uh, a list of, say, transactions and trying to determine whether this person is a fraudulent account, the next step might be cancelling that person's account or reporting them to some sort of higher authority. Now, that's not a decision to make lightly. Uh, lightly, if you're reporting a bunch of your customers to the police and it turns out that they're all fine, that's not really going to be good for business. Uh, similarly, if you're doing a lot of medical procedures, that's going to be bad. Now, there are plenty of scenarios, say, classifying a picture of uh, on your smartphone as you know your dog or determining whether there's any bananas in the photo. That sort of thing really doesn't need this sort of analysis because regardless of the outcome and how accurate that model is, it's pretty unlikely that whether it gets the banana classification right or not is going to have a large disproportionate impact one way or the other. So you can think that you know, decision curve analysis is really useful in not just high risk, but high impact scenarios where the cost of dealing with a positive result, whether it be a true positive or a false positive, is quite high. That makes me think of another application around a decision having a lot of impact and that is around capital allocation, especially in the higher risk forms of investment, whether that be pharmaceutical trials or whether that be venture capital. Could you imagine this having an application there? So I could. I think the difficult thing in, say, an application of should we take this drug to a clinical trial, uh, and especially in human clinical trials, is that getting a validation set and the real ability to calibrate that model, which ultimately needs to happen here to make this work, uh, is going to be very difficult. You know, you can give a score and you can pick probably the most likely to succeed drug out of the mix. But to be able to turn that score, let's say, you know, a score between one and a thousand into an actual concrete probability of success requires this additional step called calibration, uh, which often requires a number of examples, uh, both positive and negative, across the broad spectrum of scores to then allow you to run those cases through, get their scores and convert those scores back into a probability, uh, which is often very difficult to do in complex scenarios, say like in a clinical trial. And so the limiting factor on using a model like this then turns out to be the endpoint that you have within your data set and how you calibrate your models around those. Definitely. So yeah, one of those underlying criteria is a well calibrated model and it's probably a great topic for another video. These models rely on a probability, ideally a calibrated probability, in order to allow the end practitioner to make a useful probabilistic decision about whether to intervene or not. Thanks for tuning in. Hit the like, subscribe and bell button to continue getting all the updates from us on the world of AI and machine learning.